large Debian infrastructure. I'm going to share the talk with uh, Matteo Canai. So the first part. main thing you can do is to actually just navigate to an individual source code file, which is part of Debian or past, and you will see that source code file, very important, like the cow say utility, which I'm pretty sure content of that file is, and do some fancy stuff like uh, adding messages, as I'm going to show you later. But at the default message, you will just see the content of the file, syntax highlighted, in This interesting. So, if you just do a pt-get source and obtain on your disk, Other devices. So having a web app to do that is actually pretty useful because it's where we can standardize and give access to people to the source code of Debian independently on the machine they are using uh, to actually uh, go, go through that specific um, piece of source code. Um, so an alternative to that, you can just go to sources Debian net with wherever browser you want. So we care quite a bit about graceful degradation. So it also works with uh, text only uh, web browser. And you can do that on a wide number of machines. Um, I will briefly go through the features that you find on web sources. So the basic feature I've already mentioned is a uh, source code highlight. So you might wonder which languages are supported. So we use a framework to do uh, syntax highlighting in the browser client side, which is called highlight.js, which support like 110 languages and they actually welcome support for additional languages. So all the uh, well-known languages are in there. We have managed to add support for other stuff which was not supported, like the Scilab um, source code file, thanks to uh, patches by Debian users. And this is what you will obtain by default. So which part of Debian are included? Quite a bit. So actually, you will find all um, suites that we call live suites. So basically, all Debian releases you can actually find on the Debian Mirror network are included, from all the old stable to experimental. Okay, So everything which is on the Debian Mirror will be in there. And actually, every time the Debian Mirror is updated, we receive a push notification. So the content of the sources is immediately updated. But we have more than that. We also have all the uh, archived release going back to ham. Okay, the reason why we don't have the releases before ham is that there are some differences in the format of source code back of source packages. So we need to do some fiddling with dpkg source to be, to be able to extract that. It is in the working, but all releases starting from ham to experimental are actually included, which is quite a bit of course source code. So 
in addition to actually just browse like file by file and version by version to the specific file you want to see, you can actually also search through all this uh, amount of source code and you can search by various ways. So you can search by package name and we do support like incomplete matches if you don't know uh, exactly the name of the package you are looking to, you are looking for. You can search by, um, by files and you can search the content of file. So how do you search the content of file where we index them in various ways. The native index indexing we do ourselves is actually C tags. So every single time we add a source code file to web sources, we run C tag on that, on that file. And that means that all symbols which are defined by developers, such as variable names or constant names or type names and all this kind of stuff can be used as keyword to actually search for content in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the sources. And additionally, we have a uh, integration with code search Debian net, which actually allows you to do regular expression searches on the actual content of source code file, and you can s use code search de 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 Debian .net from the source Debian .net interface to actually search for the content of, uh, of source code. Just a caveat, search Debian .net does not index all the source code we have in Deb sources. It only index, I think, unstable, uh, and it's not updated every time there is a mirror push. So the amount of source code you search if you use code search Debian .net is actually a bit smaller than what you find in the sources. But it's usually what you want to, uh, to search through for bugs or that kind of stuff. Um, the search, of course, is not done on the fly, so it's done in Postgres, so we have pretty big indexes, and I'm gonna show you some number later, but it's actually pretty fast. <coughs> this is the actual user interface you can use for uh, for searching, and it allows me to point out that there is another kind of search that I haven't mentioned. So we do SHA-256 indexing of all the source files which are in web sources. So if you want to check whether a specific source, a specific version of a specific source file is included in, uh, in uh, web sources, you can do that and just enter the, the, the hash of the file. Um, we do support not only displaying of the content of the of specific source files, but we offer some additional features which serves different use cases. So for instance, you might be a developer which want, wants to point other developers to specific line of a source code file and add some annotation like, hey, I found a bug here. Or you might be a user that stumbled upon some uh, source code related error during the, the you were using their Debian machine, or you might be a tool you might be using a tool that does some static analysis of files, and you might want to associate specific lines of code with errors generated by, uh, by those tools. So we support that with a syntax which allows you to call into web sources and adding specific messages in the URL. So in this example, you say a URL in which we have added a message which is Debian rocks, okay, and we associated it to a specific file uh, and to a specific line of that file. Okay, so you can do those sort of annotation and you can also ask the sources to highlight those lines for you. So you can actually use the sources as a static code base of the Debian source code and just point into that using links from other web applications. You can do, um, uh, so these are the other examples. So you can add a message here between associated to line 17. And another example here is static uh, analysis example in which you might have find error and you can just add it to a specific line. Uh, and everything is documented, there is a specific URL scheme you can use and it's, it's actually pretty simple. So it's just get parameters you add to the URL. Um, thanks to the fact that we compute checksums for all the source code files that are in web sources, we actually can find duplicates. Okay, so when you go to a specific rendering of a specific file in the sources, you will find here, maybe with the light you cannot see it very well, but here it says duplicates 4,309. So this is because it's a fairly common file, which is the content of the, the, the textual version of the GPLv3 license. So DebSource knows that within the content of all the files indexes, there are about 4,000 different copies of this license, okay? Sorry, 4,000 identical copies of throughout all the source code indexes by, uh, by DebSource. So, it's an example of a very large number of duplicates, but it might be interesting to find out that specific files are actually shipped by many different packages, and we have the information to do that. Um, you can use DebSources itself in the other applications, in the Debian infrastructure, but it's actually also already been integrated into a number of other services in the Debian ecosystem. So I've already mentioned code search, and the way we have an integration with it is that you have a search form on the deb sources where you just, when you, enter, when you enter search queries in there, you will just be redirected to code search. And 
will recognize that you are coming from so the sources. So when you um, find a result on consearch.debian.net, you will be redirected back to sources Debian.net for rendering the results you have encountered. And this is actually pretty nice because it avoids having to reinvent the wheel of having a lot of different applications doing display of Debian source code with syntax highlighting. You can just talk to us and we can integrate the service into, into the sources. It is already integrated into the package tracking system for the new uh, package tracker, which is at tracker.debian.org. So you will see a nice link, which is browse the source code. And when you click in there, you will be redirected to the specific version of your package you're, you're visiting. Actually, sorry, in the PTS, you'll be redirected to the latest version of the source code of the package, which is available in the sources. Um, you can also just embed the, the specific windows of the sources in your web application. So we do have an API where you can just use an iframe and have the syntax highlighting of a specific source code file embedded in your application. This, is, this works, but it might be a bit clumsy, so not every Debian developer likes, actually, not every, sorry, web developer likes using iframes. So if you want something better, you can talk to us and we can see if we can find better form of integrations. Um, we do have some statistics. So what have, uh, with the data we have, we actually do some statistics which are both specific to individual packages, individual version of packages, and also aggregated through all the data of the sources. So for instance, when you are within a specific version of a package on the sources, you will find what we call an info box. So it's something which is floating on the right while you're browsing to the source code. And it contains information about all the data we have extracted from that specific package. So for instance, you will find general Debian information like links to the PTS or the version control system. You will find information about the area, so this package is in main. You find information about which suite this package is, uh, is available from, so Jesse and Sid in this case. And you will find information we have computed ourselves after integrating the package into the sources. So for instance, here you can see that Chromium is actually two, gig two gigabytes of source code when you, when you want to uh, extract it on your machine, that it contains about two million developer-defined symbols, so name of function, name of constants, name of variables, and so on and so forth. And you will find the result of slug count. So we compute uh, how many lines of code of each languages are available in uh, this specific package. So you will find that the, uh, the topmost language in Chromium is about 10 millions of C code. You will find, uh, sorry, 10 millions of C++. You will find 3 millions of uh, uh, ANSI C and, and then Python and then go on descending. Um, so these are the statistics which are specific to a given package. And then you have statistics which are aggregated to all, all the content of uh, Deb sources. So you can go to sources.debian.net slash stats, okay? And there you will find metrics, how much, uh, uh, how much does it take to actually have all the source code of Debian Jesse on your machine? This page knows. So the amount of lines of code which are in current SID, this page will tell you. So as an example, these are stats for SID as of yesterday, I think. So in SID, we currently have about 11 million source code files. We have 23,000 source packages. It will take you 228, uh, that's uh, gigabytes, right? Of this to have all the source code on your machine, about 127 million of uh, developer-defined symbol, and a bit more than a billion lines of code. This is what we ship when we ship SID to our users. If you're curious, the most popular languages in SID, so the topmost is C, plus plus, and then Python. And it wasn't the case a few years back. So we also have nice trends showing the evolution of uh, programming languages over time. And we do have statistics which are not aggregated through all uh, releases, but also statistics dedicated to specific releases. Uh, we do some fancy graphs where we're not that good at graphing, but we, we try. So this is the evolution, for instance, of the, the most popular programming languages over time. So you see Squeeze here, you see Wheezy, you see Jesse, you see Sid, and those in between are actually the smaller suites, like the uh, update suite or the LTS suite. Um, last thing before uh, passing the mic to Mathieu is so everything I discussed is available essentially via user interface. So it's something you use in your web browser, and the user built on top of HTML and JSON, basically. But all the information we expose on the user interface are also exposed to developers via an API. So there is a JSON-based API, which you can use to extract any kind of information you might want to have from the sources and use it programmatically. 
So for instance, you can, if you are interested in statistic, we have in the info box of specific packages, like how many so lines of source code in C are part of uh, uh, Chromium, you can use an API to extract that information. And having said that, I'm passing the mic to Mathieu for the upcoming news. Thank you, Zach. One, two, one, two, it's working. Okay, I'm gonna present to you now the new f features which have been integrated into Dev Sources since last DevConf. So there have been a lot. We had first an uh, outreach student, Ying Ji Yang, and we ran off the work of two GSOC students, Clement Schreiner and Orestis Yowanu. Uh, we had also many extern a lot of many new external contributors. Oh, you can see the list of their patches here. So uh, this feature enables uh, many pop-up messages uh, included in the um, uh, sorry in the in the code, so this is useful for instance uh, with compilers if they find uh, many errors they can point the user to many places in in the code. This was not uh, the case before. Uh, something new that needed a lot of refactoring has been done by, by our outreach student is the blueprints. So we use Flask internally. Uh, in Python to do to display the web app, and now we have many blueprints which are plugged together, and this enables to to have new applications working on the code base uh, on all the code we archive in depth sources. So more of this later. Okay, um, nice fancy fancy feature is the um, detailed listing of files, so you can see the writes on the files and their sizes just like in ls-l. Uh, file edition, now through a Chromium or Firefox plugin, you can edit directly the files in your browser with a, uh, JavaScript magic. And now you just click a button, a button and the patch is gen generated, which you can send to the Debian maintainer of the package. That means that the entire Debian archive is editable through a JavaScript-based browser. Thanks to Rafael Geisner for this. Ah, okay, about GSOC now. Uh, we have a new blueprint, blueprint application, which is plugged to all the uh, archived code in the sources, which is about the copyright files. So there is uh, a part of the archive that uses machine-readable copyright files. <coughs> so why not parse and display this information in the web interface? compute statistics about the usage of licenses, generate SPDX files. They are a uh, license exchange format developed, developed by the Linux Foundation. Oh, and also an API to, to get this same information about licenses uh, through the web interface. It, it looks like that. So you can actually click on the files, click on the licenses, and they will, they will point you to the right places. A second external blueprint application is the patch tracker. Maybe you've heard of the old patch tracker, which is not online anymore. So as a new blueprint made by uh, OSTIS, a uh, GSOC student, um, it does more or less the same things with a couple of new features. For, for, instance, for now, it only supports the quilt format. It will syntax highlight the package, just like the source code in the sources. And you can also query it via an API to get the list of patches and their content. And it looks like that. So you can see that you can view and download the patches directly and get the li list of their descriptions, their file deltas uh, uh, aggregated on one page. Our second GSOC student, Clement Schreiner, worked about an asynchronous updater because until now we had a synchronous updater. So it needed a rewrite of all the stages of the updater, uh, add package and compute stats or garbage, garbage collection or just examples. We're using the Celery Python package to actually spawn independent and asynchronous tasks. If you want to get more information about these features, they have presented it in the GSOC session this afternoon. You can see the video. 
and they will be really soon available on sources.debian.net. We are merging them currently. Uh, other, other new features that were not there one year ago. So a bit of refactoring. Now DevSource is a top-level Python module. This is intended for packaging DevSources, which will happen one day. Uh, new configuration loader. Now we are Flake 8 compliant, which is a better Python code for sure. Test coverage. Uh, today we have 85% of test coverage. I don't remember the number for last year, but that's way better. Uh, you can look for package names uh, case insensitive. That's a small new feature. We have better statistic charts, thanks to our Looking for a very ancient package or actually a new one. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, better statistics charts, thanks to our DSOC student. Uh, Python 3 support. Yeah. I think it's almost there. Um, modulo uh, dependency. Oh. And now the roadmap. So the new features we would like to have in the, in the incoming month. So the big picture is use the sources uh, as a platform are uh, the display pl platform of something bigger, which, which is called Dbuild, uh, to run automatic runs of static analysis tools. So the sources could be used to display the results of these tools along with the message this, this tool produces. So we can embed this message in the pop-up pop feature we, we saw before. We could also gather statistics about the bugs evolution and how they disappear from release to release. Uh, you can check the, the build project for that. Uh, we would like to have more live statistics. Stats are, are nice about licenses, patches, and their evolution. File name search. This is currently not possible. And the link between all the binary package and the source package. For now, we, you can only look for source package. It would be nice to have the automatic link. If you, if you don't know the name of the source package you're looking for. The tarball in tarball support, which is not trivial. For instance, what do we do with tarball in tarball in tarballs? That's never easy. Oh, well, 100% uh, test coverage. This will happen one day as well. Uh, file level deduplication. So we have a lot of similar files. The GPL v3 we mentioned before was an example. Uh, you can see that the deduplicated core of the code uh, archived by depth sources is about 45%. This is mainly due to all the files copied to different versions of, of a package. So if you could do this to at the file system level, we would, we would save a lot of disk space. Okay, about the technologies uh, behind the box. So everything is almost in Python. Uh, the web application uh, uses the Flask framework with blueprints, Jinja 2 templates, and all the web-related technologies like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, PostgreSQL is behind to store the data in the database. We use Apache Web Server, SQL Alchemy <coughs> as an ORM to, to talk to PostgreSQL. And that's a picture of uh, the, the schema behind web sources. So you can see as a user that you have access to the web, web sources web app. As a miner, you can have access to the web app through the API to get JSON results. And you can also compute uh, SQL directly on the, um, on the DB if you talk to us, if you have uh, some kind of special request for some interesting statistics, for instance. So we do have a local mirror and a copy of this mirror with all the extracted package. This takes a lot of space as we will see after. And well, all the details for updating through the mirror, getting the um, information from archive.debian.org, etc. That's a couple of tables from our PostgreSQL. So you can see there are a lot, a lot of information in there. And then in, for instance, we have 
almost 400 millions of different C tags. Um, well, that's the bigger table, the biggest table, sorry. Okay, about disk usage. Uh, the impact sources currently take more than 800 gigabytes. The PostgreSQL almost 150 gigabytes, and the source mirror 135 gigabytes. In total, it needs 1.1 terabytes, and it's increasing. It was 800 gigabytes one year ago. And so that's the evolution of the disk usage on our machine. The peak is due to the inject injection of all the suits in archive.debian.org, so that's normal. Okay, uh, a last point. We also use Deb Sources as a research platform, especially about the statistics we, we gathered on all the content. So Deb Sources is a huge software collection. It's homogeneous because all the software in there respect the Debian's packaging format. It is up to date. So we have there 20 years of source code evolution and plugins to compute stats on all this source code. So we can have nice charts. For example, what are the trending programming languages and how they have changed in the last 20 years. This is all the plugins we have. So you can see the evolution of the number of packages, the number of files in the archive, the number of lines of code, of C tags, and the disk usage. Uh, about the C tags, there is uh, something different with squeeze. Uh, it, it's a bug. It's not supposed to be there, but we, it's, we don't know currently why it looks like that. So it's, it's mostly inc increasing. No surprise there. And uh, that's the file size per language. So it's actually quite interesting to see the shell scripts really began, became bigger and bigger before actually uh, becoming smaller in the recent releases. Um, that's the absolute evolution of lines of code per language. So almost every language is increasing. And you can see notably C <coughs> and C++ that are bigger and bigger. On the other hand, we have also computed the relative evolution of this language. And C is de decreasing. There is more and more of C file, but not compared to the rest. And notably because there is more and more C++, Java, and Python. Um, it's not getting uh, bigger for GC. At the time we computed this, GC was testing, and there were things like two times the Chromium package there, or the Linux package. So that explains this uh, <coughs> small peak in, on the right. If you're interested in this, you can read the research articles uh, Stefano and me have written. The first one is about the last charts I've shown you. The second one is about the deep sources data set and how you can use all the data that is in deep sources in a reliable way. The PDFs are online. Finally, a last point. If you want to hack on deep sources, we have, um, oh, first you can clone the Git repository, which is in uh, the QA team. Uh, everything is written in the hacking file. Or you can use Docker to actually set up a deep sources instance on your machine uh, with a couple of lines to execute, the deep sources Docker build and run. You will get a container which contains deep sources with a taste data included, which contains a, something like 10 or 15 different packages. So you can begin writing code on deep sources without setting up the, the entire thing, which takes 1.1 terabytes. Um, then you can actually contribute. The bugs, li bugs list is there. You can write up plugins following the plugin examples uh, which are in the, um, in the repository. You can add new features, etc. We would be glad to, to see that. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions.
Yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, do you have any statistics beyond the copyright file about uh, Debian rules, for instance, like uh, which build system uh, are used or anything which is quite specific to Debian's way or Debian patches or stuff like that? Um, for Debian patches, we are currently merging the work of our GSOC students <coughs> to compute them. For Debian rules, uh, no, we don't, but it's quite easy to write a plugin to, to get these statistics because the plugin will be executed for every new package which will come into the archive. So that looks like something interesting to do. I, is Deb sources in the Debian archive? Uh, no, it's not packaged yet. It's on my to-do list. But actually, so the, the biggest part of the work is actually the refactoring in the, using a proper top-level Python model, which is now done. So I guess it should be pretty easy to do that. Yeah. And one day we'll be able to bruise the sources in the sources. That's a great contribution for something interesting. <laughs> oh, right, actually. <laughs> Didn't think of that. We bootstrap. Yeah, exactly. Hi. Joachim Breitner wrote an email today to Debian Devil with an idea to make um, Debian source packages available as Git repositories. Each source package uh, should be one tagged um, commit in such a Git repository. And he wrote in his email that he would target um, snapshots as a source and now I'm asking myself, he's not here, unfortunately, um, whether uh, sources would be a better source to get um, reliable data, what was in a source torball at a specific version in a specific suite, and make a tagged commit out of this and provide this as Git repositories. May either pre-generated or dynamical on request. So I can take that. So actually, no, it would be better to do that with snapshot Debian org because our history here is much more coarse grained than what there is on snapshot Debian org. So in snapshot Debian org, you have every version that have ever existed in a given Debian release at a given time. Here, we only have there is the, allowed to say, the releases which were of a specific package which were available when that release was made. So we have one package version for Edge, one for Jesse, one for Ham. While in Snapshot, you also had all the releases that have been developed during the development time of a given release. So we have much less releases of any individual packages than what is available on Snapshot Debian org. Does Snapshot also go that far back in time? No, so that's a different problem, you're right. So no, we go more back in time, but that's because I think Snapshot Debian org has data only since 2006. I think, but what is not on Snapshot Debian org is on Archive Debian org. So for old stuff, yes, it would be the same to actually use what we have on Archive Debian org. Thank you. Just somewhat a silly question. Haven't, haven't you accumulated this many files? Did you do stats, like how many files collided M MD5 sum, but they are distinct files, and then how many in SHA? Well, you know, longer checksum would be different. So we only have SHA-256 right now, so. so compare, like, right, right, no, we haven't done that yet, but we actually you're right, so we would be fun to do. Yeah. I don't think there will be any collision, by the way, but. <laughs> Not even with, that, with MD5, but. Hello, would you be interested in, um, contribution which imported sources yes. from derivatives? <laughs> Two, maybe? So no, I, I said yes before the end of, because we are always interested in contributions. Always. So we, there is an open bug about integrating into Deb sources, source code from other derivatives. And that's actually something which is really cool. But before tackling that, we actually need to implement file level deduplication. Otherwise, we'd just explode. Yes, this would become crazy. Right. Other than that, would it, would it be particularly hard for somebody to do, or would it be easy, do you think? Is it pluggable, like, or how much do you hard code Debian stuff in there? I think it would be actually pretty easy, so. No, I don't really know. So, I, I mean, the, the, essentially, 
the key we are using is like the sweet name. So as long as we have a clear naming scheme which differentiates packages coming from other derivatives, there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I'm curious about uh, any uses of uh, your service by external people like uh, were there any publications by academics uh, outside of your team and also uh, for instance uh, for people looking for copyright litigations whatever is the SPDX stuff useful or do you have any evidence that uh, it is really used? So the publication we have shown you are still pretty young, so the, the oldest one is like last year. So no, I'm not aware of other publication except to, uh, from other ones that have been made. I know I've been contacted by researcher interested in using the data set, but I don't know if they have yet published anything. Regarding the, um, the licensing information, so one of the use case which motivated our work on the Debian copyright tracker in a way is that we have both the license information and the file checksums. So we can provide information about license and copyright information as they are seen in Debian to other people. And we have an API that allows to do that. It doesn't mean that our information are correct, because we might always have bugs in Debian copyright files, and actually we don't have that many machine readable Debian copyright files yet, even though in SID is more than 50% of the archive these days. Uh, but so that's one of the use case. And actually one of very interesting use case, we also have C tags. So you can do like fancy stuff like have a binary, let's look with NM, the symbols which are identified in this binary, and let's see if in that sources there is a matching file which have all these symbols. And let's see what's the license of that file in, in according to Debian. So yes, those use cases are one of the reasons why we're doing this work. But, and we have been contacted by the SPDX working group about working together, but we don't have anything uh, publicly available yet. Oh, maybe. You never know. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, I will say that's it. So thanks a lot, Zach. And Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>